Bill Bedrick is an Apache Kafka committer and the author of Event Streaming with Kafka Streams and KSQL DB. He's also the author of the Kafka Streams course on Confluent Developer. So I had him on the show today to talk about that course. Really, I tried to take him through like a whirlwind summary of that content. Like, can I compress that into 25 minutes? Let's try. So listen to me and Bill talk about Kafka Streams. Before we get there, a reminder, streaming audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer. That's developer.confluent.io. There's, uh, of course, a video course on Kafka Streams there. There are Kafka tutorials that show you step-by-step -step how to write code, to do uh, basic operations with Kafka Streams. There's a library event of event-driven design patterns, all kinds of great resources for learning Kafka. When you go there, if you do any of the exercises, you'll have to sign up for Confluent Cloud. You want to use the podcast 100 code it gives you an extra hundred dollars of free usage so check out confluent developer developer.confluent.io and now listen in as bill and i talk about kafka streams hello and welcome to another episode of streaming audio i'm your host tim Berglund, and i'm joined here in the studio today by my colleague and author of Kafka Streams in Action, Bill Betch. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, was, I paused for a second. There's, like, there's, uh, there's several of these books. That's the one. Yes, Manning's yeah. Kafka Streams in Action. Yeah, and um, there's, there's actually a second edition underway, Event Streaming with Kafka Streams in KSQL DB. Nice. Okay, that sounds like a whole new book. Uh, yeah, it's meant to be a second edition, but... Uh, I decided to pull back the lens a little bit and cover the whole streaming platform. And then, of course, I look at what I wrote back then a couple of years ago and, you know, have to change it. So. You got to change it. You just have yeah. to. Yeah. This reminds me of um, uh, years ago, I was taking a, a graduate philosophy course on metaphysics and it was super wild class. Like, loved the experience. Easily the most difficult reading I've ever done in my life. Like you could clock kind of five to seven pages an hour. Oh, wow. And you'd have to go through it again. It was just like, just at the limit of my ability to comprehend. And there was a, a philosophy of computation book, and I can't remember the name of the professor, but it was a second edition. And in the preface, he said something like, in this is the second edition of a book. I'm not sure it's the same book as the first book. <laughs> And like for a metaphysics book, that's actually really funny because, you know, like holes and parts and myriad, yeah. you know, anyway, this is not a philosophy podcast. This is a Kafka and event streaming podcast. And you're a Kafka committer and a guy who writes about streams and works in developer relations at Confluent. So um, you're also the author of our course on Confluent developer on Kafka streams. Yes. And so I, I, I want to talk about that. I kind of want to go over the whole thing in like a rapid fire fashion if we can, sure. just to give people a, a tease. But um, before I do that, I, I know you've been on the podcast before, but um, maybe current listeners weren't listening then. Tell us a little bit about what you do and, and just you before we get sure. started. Sure. Uh, well, I'll just start at the top. I've been in Confluent for over four years now, which is right. hard to believe. It's gone by really fast. Um, spent the first uh, about three-ish years on, as an engineer on the Kafka Streams team. Uh, and then I decided to follow. I, I, I've discovered partly through writing the book, the first one, the first edition, uh, that I like to teach. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I also like to, you know, I like to present a, in a teaching manner. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's hard to hard to describe the charge you get out of that, but it's I do. It's a powerful realization. If it if it if, if it is you, and once you see it, it's it changes your choices. Yeah, and uh, I still love to write code. I still like engineering. There's parts of engineering that I miss being an engineer full time, but I think the balance, the scales tip a little bit more to I'd like to be in developer relations that writes code versus being in engineering and does some dev developer relations stuff. So. Yeah, that's the balance. So I've been uh, been in DevX uh, for over a year now. Um, don't was, regret it. So said it's longer, a lot of fun. That seems. I guess that's about right. And the team the the team that builds on is uh, we we call it integration architecture. But a more stand as much as these things are standardized, it might be called like developer relations engineering in other teams. So you you yeah you yeah. write code. 
for the purpose of explaining how things work. Yeah. Um, yes, exactly. And uh, that's one nice thing about our uh, team. If anyone's thinking of joining, uh, one nice thing about our team is you've got a lot of latitude for different roles you can get into. Yeah, very so, much. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've got this course on Confluent Developer. It's, it's, a, it's a video course on Kafka Streams, I think. Of the courses that we have deployed in the last few months, uh, we're recording this at the end of September 2021, um, easily the most comprehensive because it's written by you, because you're a guy who likes to teach, and you're kind of a world-leading expert on the subject matter. And this podcast is going to be a survey of the material in that course, not a substitute for it. It's more of a teaser. Uh, you know, my goal is if you're listening to this and you're interested in Kafka streams, you're going to think, well, I should really go, I should really go take that course. Um, so Mr. Pedrick. Yes. Uh, what's Kafka streams? Uh, Kafka streams is the native streaming library, if you will, for Apache Kafka. And it allows you to do stream processing, event stream processing on the event you have going into a Kafka cluster. Uh, the nice thing is about it is it's an abstraction over Kafka producers and consumers. So you could do the same things with consumers and producers, but you have to handle a lot of the administrative type things, you know, when you commit and uh, uh, things along those lines. So it, kind of frees you from that, lets you really focus on business logic and what you want to do to those records in the event stream. There you go. Um, that's a, a point I make frequently. And I, I there's this joke I've been making for years. I have a slide that's just a picture of Admiral Akbar um, <laughs> because it's a trap for you to write that kind of framework code. It, it can seem fun. Um, I mean, it is fun that there's a there's, Actually, recreating Kafka streams by yourself wouldn't be fun. That would be very hard. But you know, little bits of framework things when you when you encounter those problems when you're just writing consumers and you're thinking, oh, hey, the way I'm doing windowing, I could make that a little more sophisticated. Uh, and you start down that path, and you're building code that isn't delivering value to a customer or a user. Uh, Ex yeah, exactly. It's like developers like to write code, and that's all fun. But then you get to the point where you're kind of deviating off what the business needs are, if you will, and yeah, you're yeah. writing, spending lots of time. And the thing is, I th uh, not to belabor the point, but I think developers lose sight of what you write you have to support. So the more infrastructure thing, like you said, that's not delivering business value, you still have to support that. It's going to need care and feeding. Yeah, and exactly. you never can give it as much as you want because there are business stakeholders needing you to do other things. And the the tempting thing about the framework is you're in charge. It's not some seemingly crazy business stakeholder who's asking for weird things that require yeah. you to do all kinds of special case things that aren't beautiful and violate your schema and you know the whole the whole business software thing. Yeah. Um, and framework is just is just us, you know. It's just computer science and yeah. we have to be beautiful. Um, so it's very tempting, but. You never get to give it the care and feeding it needs. It's always buggy. It's always missing features. And so using exactly. the standard thing like like Kafka Streams is, is probably a good idea. Yeah. Okay. So Kafka Streams is this computational framework that lets you focus more on business logic and less on, on framework. It's uh, uh, an abstraction on top of consumers and producers uh, that takes all the way that the, the boilerplate and framework stuff you'd have to build. How does it scale? Uh, that's one of the, my favorite parts about Kafka Streams. Uh, I mentioned some abstraction over producers and consumers. And I like to bring that up intentionally because the Kafka consumer has the rebalance protocol. Yes. Where um, you start up, say you start up three consumers and they're part of a consumer group. Logically, it looks like one consumer to the broker. So if you... For some reason, you stop a consumer, it's going to be a rebalance and assign the part topic partitions that that consumer, say if consumers A, B, and C, uh -huh. you stop consumer C. Uh, there's going to be a rebalance and whatever topic partitions consumer C was responsible for get reassigned to A and B. Right. You don't have to handle that. Uh, so Kafka Streams natively has that same thing. 
you uh, there's only two required configurations when you have a Kafka Streams app, and that's the app, application ID is one of them. Which is Bootstrap equivalent servers. to the group ID, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you, Bootstrap servers, you said. I, yeah. I talked over you. Uh, and you give it the application ID, and it's the same thing. So you spin up three Kafka Streams applications. Or let's just, I'm sorry, let me start in the simple case. You start with one. Sure. And let's One just instance, say, one application. Application exactly. ID is Angry Monkey or something. Yeah. yeah. And you want to have more processing power. You want to process more records. You spin up a second instance with that same application ID. Logically, it's one application. Now it's, you've got two separate applications running, two separate- Two instances. Two yeah. instances running. But logically, it's one. And the same thing happens. Whatever, let's just say you're processing a topic with four partitions. That initial instance has all is assigned all four partitions. But now you spin up your second one. It's going to dynamically rebalance. Uh, well, it's going to rebalance and then dynamically allocate two of those partitions to that new instance. And you could do that up to four application instances with the same ID, and they would all end up given that you've got four partitions. Exactly. But Bill says the skeptic, regular consumers do that. Uh, yes, that's true. And that's leveraging. That's the, to me, that's the beauty of it because it's leaveraging the same rebalance protocol. So it's. Exactly. It's so it's Kafka built out of Kafka. And we're going to talk yeah. about stateful operations later. That's, there's some real money that, that comes in here. There's some pieces we don't have on the table, but if you're thinking, we just talked about how consumer groups scale. Yeah, we did. But, um, your state comes with you is, is the short story. And mm -hmm. that's, that's an amazingly, uh, good thing. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. The, um, the structure of the API, I, I read about a thing called a DSL and uh, a declarative mode or the, the processing API. Uh, what's that all about? Tell us that. Sure. Kafka Streams comes with, um, the D it's got two APIs and you've got the DSL, uh, which is, it follows a fluent, a fluent, uh, the fluent pattern where you can say, you know, you create a, you create a, um, a streams builder object. That's what starts everything else. But then you say builder.stream and that returns a kstream object. And then you can just keep chaining different methods on top of that. Like methods that result in a modified kstream return an instance of a kstream. Exactly. Like dot, 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 dot. Typical yeah. pattern. Like, um, so you've got the DSL and right now I'm just going to talk about, you'd mentioned stateful before. Right now I'm just going to talk about stateless operators. Um, so a typical pattern could be say builder.stream and then you could say dot filter where you pass in a predicate. I only want to see records that match this given condition. And then you can call like a map values after that where, okay, I want to change the each key value pair that's coming through that passes the filter. I want to modify it. I want to create a new value. You know, yeah. Append uh, the so. last name and first name to be name or something like that. Exactly. For some very sophisticated stream processing that, you know, that would take years of research. Exactly. Uh, and, but with the, with the DSL, it's very, it, it's, it's the easiest way to get started and it's very opinionated with what you can do. Um, but you're, you're never saying, you're never telling Kafka streams how to do it. You're just saying what I want to do the record. So it's, that's in that respect, it's uh, the burden on the developer is very light. Uh, bird's not the right word, but you're really just focused on what you want to do. Uh, but as with any other, with any other framework, it's never going to solve every single problem for everybody. Um, so there's something called the processor API, which is kind of the, the uh, not the opposite, but you're, you're wiring everything up with the cut with the DSL. You're just saying builder.stream, you know, operator, operator, operator that returns a modified case stream instance. And like how it all gets wired up is handled for you. Um, and then you're not, you're really just providing the little bits of logic because under the covers, Kafka Streams uh, has processors. And, but you're not providing all the code for that. You're just providing the snippet that does, like when I mentioned the predicate, you're just providing. Uh, usually it's just a lambda. Usually, yes. You pass in a lot of lambdas. Yeah, exactly. And you're just passing in the thing that does the evaluation. But under the covers, there's a 
processor, if you will, that's got a little more um, code to it, that, but that's all handled for you. So the processor API, you provide the entire processor. You know, you have, there's an interface that you have to implement and you provide, it's still, it's still pretty easy to do, but you're providing all the code there, but it gives you the ultimate flexibility. So you don't, if there's something, there's something you, you, um, we'll get, this comes into play more with stateful operators, but there's something you really want to do that's custom to your business. You can implement that. And really the processor API, you, you're unlimited with what you can do. Right. You, with the, the DS, and but hey, this is, I don't think I've ever said this on air before. I need to confess something. I love Kafka streams. That's not a confession. That's just a bona fide. Mm-hmm. I think it's an amazing. I do too. Solution. I agree. I know you, you've mm-hmm. dedicated some evenings to this. I've never liked the fact that we say DSL. I feel like we should say the fluent API or something like that. I, I just, it's not a DSL. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, an API with nicely named methods, you know, but I, I don't know. Has this come uh, up? Am I the only one? No, but that's great that you say that because that's what I was, uh, what I was struggling for before. I was thinking of the fluent builder pattern. I didn't want to say that because yeah, well, it's, it's not a builder, builder pattern. but fluent API is correct. That's, and that's what you're doing. You're just kind of going along, chaining these methods right. and then because and it- each and it should not be otherwise. I mean, it's a functional stream processing API. You should use the fluent builder pattern. It's really good. It's like super yeah. easy to read. I mean, you can write streams code that's not easy to read, but that's your fault. It does. It's not the API. The API is pretty easy to understand. So I just anyway, yeah. we don't need to. I just it's not a DSL. Yeah. But um, when you're writing the the builder code, the DSL, I'll just say it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you're, that code is creating data structures. That code executes is creating data structures inside the builder, which then get operated in these processors and inside workers and threads and all the stuff in the framework that you shouldn't necessarily need to care about. When you're doing the processor thing, that's like, okay, here's a message. You've got access to all this state storage and all this parts of the framework. You do what you want. Yeah. Um, and that's a good point you raised because with the, when you're using the Fluent API... DSL. Um, it's under the covers. It's building a topology. It's and it's wiring everything up because if you have when you create a source node and then your source node reads from a topic, it's going to consume those records uh, or get those records in. But then you need to hand it off to another processor for it to do something. And when you're using the the fluent approach, that's handled for you. You just say builder.stream, and that sets up the source node, and let's uh, go back to the filter, and you say dot .filter. Under the covers, that's establishing the parent-child relationship where the source node is the parent of the filter. Right. But then not, if you not put- Not modifying that first stream. You can't. You're- No, 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 no. A new one. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then, so that's the parent of the, of the filter. So it's going to feed its records to the filter operator, filter node, if you will. Um, but then if you do something after that, which you, you will, you know, you're already in filter records, well, then you want to do something with the ones that pass through the filter. That becomes the parent of the next node and so on. So it builds up this topology, which is really just a, a directed directed acyclic graph, or yes. DAG. Always a DAG uh, in things yeah. like this. And so these records come in and they flow through. Um, you can have, a parent can have more than more than one child node. And when you, so the, my point in bringing that up is when you go to the processor API, you have to exclusive, you have to do those relationships. You create your processor node and declare it, you know, as a source node. And then you, uh, when you create, you give it a unique name. And then when you create your next processor, part of the method, part of the method, a part of the uh, arguments you provide is you give it the parent name or names that are going to feed that processor. Ah, gotcha. So, gotcha. so you're explicitly you one that link. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, it's not hard, um, but it's more, I like to use the term boilerplate. Type yeah. Work. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing more stuff yourself. Yeah. But yeah. So we're, um, our, my attempts at being rapid fire are failing. We're going to go over everybody. This, this, this podcast is going to go a little long, but not too long. Bill and I, Bill and I need to get through this stuff. Um, and the DAG thing, it's it's funny. You should you should be able to look at the fluent 
builder API and just smell a DAG. Like the yeah. DAG needs to be, it's like walking down South Broadway by all the antique shops. You, there's this thing that you smell. It's just, you know, that it's there. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's a good point that you bring up that particular data structure tables. Uh, we didn't really define streams. We're talking about Kafka. There's topics, there's messages, uh, you know, like I get it. Tables now are a part of our life. What are, what are tables all about? Sure. Um, so with, you've got a, I mentioned K stream before K stream is con- considered an event stream. And what that means, and I'll tie this into, you mentioned tables. I'll tie this in with tables in a second. Um, it works, you know, it's, it's, it's under the covers, it's Kafka. So everything's a key value pair. And in an event stream, records, key values, where the keys are the same, don't relate to each other. If we have a banking app and we're looking at customer interactions, and let's just say the key is the customer name, and we see some records coming in where Tim Berglund's the key, even though we've got multiple keys with Tim Berglund as the key, they're not related to each other. They're independent events. Uh, now we've got with a K table is uh, that's considered an update stream, and what that means now the keys that are related to each other, the keys that are the same are related to each other. They're considered updates to previous ones. Got it. So like my customer ID is two four six zero one, and so every time that shows up, that's a Tim Berglund thing. The subsequent ones are an update to the previous one. Exactly, and banking is a great example. You go to you know you you know, withdraw cash and you're bound, you know, you know, so that's your latest action. And then, you know, you're going to deposit cash or whatever. And it doesn't make sense what I just said, but still those, those subsequent thing, the, the subsequent action is an update to the previous one. So you really only want to, usually you're only concerned about the latest one. The latest one. So a table gives you that sort of an in, in memory view of the current state of those users or whatever that object is in the stream. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess maybe stock prices is a better analogy. Yeah. Where- I always use a uh, user account. So you could put that in a database table. If you're doing this in an event driven way, every time somebody updates, creates, deletes, uh, you know, you're producing a message with a serialized copy of the, the user object. Yeah. And you had mentioned keeping an in memory. It was a great segue. You mentioned, okay, we've got a table now and it's got this in memory uh, version, if you will, whatever. Um, it's actually K tables are that leads us into stateful. Uh, just just going to pivot us there, so let's do it. Yeah. Uh, and a K table is K streams are stateless, and they don't uh, they don't keep anything. You know, records come in, you do a filter, and it comes in. Turn true false, it's done. Right. K table. Uh, it's stateful, and by default, Kafka streams, uh, there's a state store underneath the covers, and by default, it uses RocksDB as the implementation for persistent stores. Gotcha. Now, you can, if you want to, use in-memory stores. Uh, there's a trade off the plug in anything else you wanted if you wanted to write. And Yeah, and also with the API, um, there's just an interface that you have, a state store supplier, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just have to. Somebody did that with Scylla DB once. I I talked to a person who had done that. Yeah. So, yeah. Which is. And you just have to. You, you just provide it, and it just has to adhere to a, a few methods on an interface, and that's it. Um, but by default, it's a stateful. Uh, it's. I'm sorry. It's persistent store on local disk, and that's one of my favorite things. It's on local disk, uh, which means that when it comes in, when it goes to look up the value, key value pairs, or it's key value stores, it's right there. It's, there's no network right. hop, no going over. It's right there at local disk. Um, and then they're per, they're uh, backed up by what's called a change log topic. So you never really have to worry about, you lose your, your Kafka stream instance, struck by lightning, boom, gone. Uh, all that data that was in that store has been persisted in what's called a change log topic. So when you spin up, an instance to replace the one you lost, it's going to replenish the state store from the change log topic. So you're back in business. And and that's on local um, disk and it's in the cluster. If you need to go to the network and bring it in off the cluster, it's yeah. it's persisted there and, and, and replicated and everything that things in your cluster are. 
Yeah, exactly. And um, I had mentioned you can opt in and do in-memory stores. In-memory is going to be a little faster for you because it doesn't go to read, disk to read. Uh, but when you shut down an instance, even if it doesn't get struck by lightning, you just decide you need to turn it off for a little while. Uh, it's going to lose everything because it was only a memory. But when it comes back up, when you start it back up, again, the change log topic, which is your best friend, uh, it's going to replenish it. So even though it's in memory, uh, you, you pick up right where you left off. Tell us about timestamps. This is a yes. tough one to do quickly, I know. Um, What's time all about? Okay. Um, back in Kafka, I think it was... 0.11, timestamps were introduced yes. to the records. Um, so when you produce a record, if you don't, part of the producer record, uh, one of the overloaded constructors, you can give it a timestamp. If you don't, the producer puts one in for you. Uh, and that's, you know, timestamps do all kinds of wonderful things. And that allows uh, the brokers to decide, okay, you know, um, you can specify how long, you want records to live and the timestamps help drive that because mm -hmm. it's going to do that. You know, it's going to go find, okay, you know, okay, this, you know, this record is, you know, past the time, whatever, or the segment, I'm sorry, I'm kind of probably going too much detail, but uh, it finds a segment that's ready to go and we'll delete that segment. Okay. So we've talked about timestamps. Kafka stream uses those timestamps for driving behavior um, with stateful applications, what, what like with windowing, um, there, and well, let me back this up. There's a notion of stream time, which is the highest timestamp that it's seen so far. And Kafka streams uses those timestamps to determine which record to process next. So it's going to look at its import partition and the one with the lowest timestamp the topic partition with the lowest timestamp on it is what gets picked next for processing records. Got it. So, um, and then, well, I guess this kind of seg. So that we've got this notion of stream time I mentioned. It's a which, low you can't, which you can't really talk about without talking about Windows. So if you want to go to Windows, go to Windows. Yeah. Yeah. And so stream time is the. I'm sorry. Did I say lowest? Probably stream time is the furthest timestamp you've seen so far. Okay. Most time. recent. Most most re most recent Are time. Farthest in most progressed in time. Yeah. yeah. And the significant thing about that is is as time as records come in with timestamps that are greater than that, that's what advances stream time. But if you get what's known as an out of order record that's earlier than stream time, it doesn't advance stream time. Good. It'll get that record gets processed, but it doesn't invite it doesn't advance. Um so that kind of helps us pivot into windowing. Uh, stateless operators, I'm sorry, stateful People. operators. Yeah. Um, think of an aggregation. Count is a good one. You just want to, you want to do a count of, again, going back to- How many times user 24601 updated his account in the last five minutes? Weird aggregation, but let's go with it. Yeah. So you've got, you, records come in, you're keeping track by key. Um and you're going to do a count, but that's just going to keep growing over time. You know, a customer 24601, you know, let's just say this person's really active all the time. That count just keeps getting bigger. So windowing gives you a way to bucket it, if you, uh, for lack of a scientific term. And you can say, um, I only want to know the, well, not that I only want to know. It'll give you the count for a defined window. Mm -hmm. And there's different windows in Kafka streams. You've got just uh, what's called a tumbling window, which opens at a certain, you say, you know, windowed by a tumbling window of like, say, an hour. It's going to give you the count for an hour, the last hour of that customer did something. And then uh, the then count resets also, at the end of that hour. Yeah, exactly. Those, those are epic aligned, right? So that's that's on an hour boundary. Exactly. Yeah. But driven by the time, and this is where the timestamps come into play, driven by... Uh, the window size is driven by the timestamps of the record. So customer 24601, super busy, but then doesn't do anything for, you know, let's say he stops working at 12, like his last record's at 12. Another record doesn't come in until 2 p.m. by our 
clock on the wall, that's still within that one hour, that's still within the window of the of the aggregation. Yes. It's, so it's driven by the timestamp. So the, t- the windows only advance based on the timestamps of the records themselves. Gotcha. Uh, oh, okay. So the, the record has to happen. There's no thread sitting there with a timer or saying, okay, your window's closed. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So the, the, right. win- the timestamps of the records are what drive, drives the behavior of, um, of the windowing. And it's, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, vastly simpler that way. I wouldn't want to think of the timers. That sounds terrible. I'm, I'm sorry I even said that on air. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to edit it out, though. I'm just going to take responsibility for those words. Uh, finally, mm-hmm. last question, testing. If I want to do unit testing of a stream's job, I don't, a stream's topology, and I don't want uh, to have a Kafka cluster around because that wouldn't be a unit test, and it would be overall terrible. Um, what's my story? Yes, that's uh, one of the, and again, a great gem in the Kafka Streams library. There's something called the topology test driver. Uh, what that does is that allows you to write an end-to-end unit test of your of your Kafka Streams application, but there's no broker involved. So you provide the input records, you know, and you specify the input records, and it'll run through your entire topology, even if you have state in there, if you know your stateful operators, it hits those. And then you um, extract the output. There's methods for saying, okay, give me the output records. And then you can validate that your entire topology, you're expecting some final kind of final output. Nice. And those uh, final outputs come in terms of your types, your, your domain objects, whatever the types of the, yeah, exactly. the stream or table exactly. or whatever it was. So yeah. it's not like yeah. Kafka, Kafka uh, byte arrays or anything like that. Yeah, and exactly. And it's, it does, it, it comes out with the expected types. And uh, if you do need to do more of an integration type test, I would uh, point people to test containers. I was pointed to by that by uh, pointed that by uh, my good friend Victor Gamoff. Mm -hmm. Uh, And test containers are very nice because uh, advocate of test containers. Yeah, Yeah. and before it was cool. Yeah, and uh, it really. really kind of makes, if you need to use a live broker, it makes life a lot easier for you so that you're not handling it. Integrates very well with the uh, JUnit uh, test framework. So, um, You thinking of writing any other courses? Uh, yes. I would love to do a course on schema registry. And part of that course would be um, multiple events in a topic because it's not a, I wouldn't say it's like a, Use case everyone needs to implement, but when you need it, there's some extra there's some extra consideration you need to get of it. But there are cases where if you have le- records that need to be distinct objects in your domain model, if you will, but they're closely related, so you'd like to process them in the same um, same stream, if you will. And uh, that's a that's a I find that to be a useful. Use that could be a, a useful thing to do, but there's some fundamental. There's some things you need to know, tricks to trade, if you will, that you need to know about doing that. Well, I love your work, so I hope we get to do that one soon. Yeah. All right. My guest today has been Bill Bedrick. Bill, thanks for being once again a part of Streaming Audio. All right. Thanks for uh, having me, Tim. And there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode. Now, some important details before you go. Streaming Audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer. That's developer.confluent.io, a website dedicated to helping you learn Kafka, Confluent, and everything in the broader event streaming ecosystem. We've got free video courses, a library of event-driven architecture design patterns, executable tutorials covering KSQL DB, Kafka Streams, and core Kafka APIs. There's even an index of episodes of this podcast. So if you take a course on Confluent Developer, you'll have the chance to use Confluent Cloud. When you sign up, use the code PODCAST100 to get an extra $100 of free Confluent Cloud usage. Anyway, as always, I hope this podcast was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, you can always reach out to me at TLBerglund on Twitter. That's T-L-B-E-R-G-L-U-N-D. Or you can leave a comment on the YouTube video if you're watching and not just listening, or reach out in our community Slack or forum. Both are linked in the show notes. 
And while you're at it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover us, which we think is a good thing. So thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.